Hey guys, welcome back. We're gonna do some fun stuff today. A little rapid fire myth busting. What do you say to that? I read an excellent article in the National Institutes of Health. And that, by the way, the NIH PubMed is one of the best sources of peer reviewed uh, papers. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is just going to social media and looking at what someone is saying, an influencer or whatnot, without seeing if the data that they're presenting is actually peer reviewed and of good scientific evidence. If you notice on ours, in the actual descriptions, we always put the links from where we got the data. And that way you can go back, not only verify it, but learn from it. And if you wanna go deeper into something, you can figure it out. So here we go. Hey guys, Dr. Nene here. I practice as a cardiothoracic, vascular, and general surgeon, and I'm now a health tech innovator who wants to improve lifespans and lifestyles. So stay healthy, stay curious, and keep watching. Drinking eight glasses of water a day. Drinking eight glasses of water a day. We spoke about this in a previous episode, that how much water is enough. And I had casually said 2.7 liters for females, 3.7 liters for males. But I just wanted to clarify that. Do you actually have to have eight glasses for everyone? Well, big, small, um, active, not active, it can't be the same. Second thing is, a large proportion of your water actually comes from your vegetables and from your fruits. And so when they talk about that volume, it's not necessarily correlated to just drinking the water. I think that the initial data that people had put out was to kind of get a health focus so that at the last minute when you get thirsty, you're not just drinking every time, that you're kind of uh, spacing it out from the day. But thirst is a very interesting mechanism to make you or prompt you to drink water. The other one is urine output, which is what we look at in an ICU. Um, and for adults, it should be a half cc per kilo per hour. And in kids, it should be one cc per kilo per hour. But who looks at that when you go to the bathroom? You don't put a hat in and measure it. So the idea of eight glasses strictly is not the right idea. And 2.7 and 3.7 are not strict. Not to confuse the issue, right? When you look at this, some of it should be guided by your thirst. So this debunks a little bit of what I've told you already, but in, rather than debunking, it adds a little bit of depth to what you should be thinking. Because a lot of you probably ask, well, look, I don't drink eight glasses of water, but I don't get thirsty. Now, the other side digression is as you get older, this type of mechanism may not be as accurate, getting thirsty meaning. But in the younger crowd, if you're working out and it's hot outside and whatnot, you may perspire so much fluid or you may need more hydration that you need more than eight glasses. So the point is, let your body guide you. I think urine output for me as a surgeon was an excellent indicator of whether or not you're, you're adequately hydrated. One way to test that is if you drink and then within a half an hour to an hour you need to go in to the bathroom, that's a good indication that you're pretty well hydrated. Uh, so I don't know if that helps or hurts or make it more confusing, but we'll leave links in the, bio, in the description for you so you can go back there and dig deep. Eggs are bad for your heart. All right, so eggs are bad for your heart. Everyone is saying that eggs are an issue because of cholesterol. But we've talked about this before, and I'll do a longer piece on cholesterol. In a normal, healthy person, uh, egg, a couple of eggs a day uh, is not a problem. In fact, they have about five grams of protein per egg, and the cholesterol in a large part is what contains the protein. Imagine that a uh, developing embryo actually uses that egg sac, the yolk sac, to get most of their calories. And then you can imagine that when you eat the yolk and the white, you're actually getting more caloric inputs, as well as getting uh, some fatty acids and other things. The point is, if you have risk factors for heart disease, or have already had a heart attack, or are on a doctor-driven program of reducing your cholesterol, then you have to think about it. But otherwise, I, I don't think having a couple of eggs a day is such a big deal. The second part of that equation is that cholesterol as a end metric has kind of fallen a little bit by the wayside owing to one large study with Crestor, um, which is an HMG coreoreductase, which blocks the transport of that cholesterol. 
uh, at several levels in the liver. And what it showed is that 12 years that there was no survival benefit except in patients as secondary prevention, if they've already had a heart attack or if they're very high risk, meaning first degree relative, uh, less than 50 who had a massive heart attack, or they have other risk factors which the doctors are concerned about. So I hope that helps. Uh, it doesn't make it too confusing, but I would say uh, a few eggs a day is not gonna harm you. Being cold will give you a cold. So the data on that is not even there. And while cold temperatures can change your homeostasis system, colds are caused by viruses, simple and plain. So I would say thumbs down to that one. Um, I would say that we're talking about how to stay warm on a cold day in another episode. But the point is that just having your body temperature low does not put you at higher risk of getting a cold. You could get hypothermia, that's a different deal. But getting a cold is from a virus and that's from contact. So the old wives tale that if you leave your hair wet or you go out in the cold and get cold, your higher risk of getting a cold has nothing to do with the weather or the fact that your hair is wet, but rather with the people you were exposed to and the viruses you had. Could it reduce your immune system? That's a topic of debate. And if you are severely um, uh, cold, um, then it could potentially reduce your immune system, but you wouldn't survive in that case. And so I don't think the cold is really the issue. Hope that helps. Sugar makes kids hyperactive. <laughs> so this is a commonly held belief, but the large conclusions that they draw is that sugar is not the motivator of the hyperactivity. Now, some parents may argue with me that when they give them a huge amount of chocolate and other sugars, the kids are amped up. But the truth is the sugar is not what's doing that. I think they probably are pretty hyper because they're kids. And then on top of that, you throw in a lot of fuel and make them happy. Um, so that is definitely not a thing. Eating breakfast every day can help you lose weight. So you can go either way. Now IF is a huge trend and eating breakfast every day uh, is not the vogue. In fact, you go on these massive 16 hour fast with an eight hour uh, period where you're eating. So the answer is you don't have to eat breakfast in all cases. There are There is some data which suggests uh, when you compared people who ate breakfast versus didn't eat breakfast um, that they didn't eat any more at lunchtime and the second part of that is they had 400 calories less. And the IF data, while controversial, does suggest that you can lose weight with intermittent fasting. I'm gonna boil this down to simplicity. It's what your body is used to and what you're comfortable with that dictates whether you should do it. In my case, I have uh, smaller meals more frequently and what I find is that my uh, blood sugar levels and everything else are stable. And that too, I try to go on high protein, low carb. And so for me, that's what works. What you need to do is kind of experiment a little bit, but the data on eating breakfast and losing weight is not as clear cut as they say it is. That just because you don't eat breakfast um, and as long as you don't eat high carbs or sugary snacks or things like that, chances are you can get to lunch, not eat anymore, and still um, have a healthy diet and not gain weight. You should take multivitamins every day. So we've talked about this in a separate episode. And the debate about multivitamins was only relevant in certain subpopulations. If you're eating a normal diet, chances are you're getting all the vitamins you need. Conversely, if you are a vegetarian, you may not get certain types of vitamins like vitamin B12 and whatnot, uh, which generally comes from meat products. And so in those cases, you need to supplement. And particularly in the case of vegans who don't drink milk products or, or um, eat uh, non-veg, there you may need vitamin B supplements as well as pot potentially vitamin D uh, supplements. And so there it might make a difference. Um, the next category that may need it are pregnant women because they're eating for two and they got to make sure they consume enough and they do prescribe more iron and other supplements 
And then the last category is people who've had gastric bypasses and things like that, where you don't have uh, the stomach to absorb B12. It's much smaller uh, or you're by, because you're bypassed to the intestine. Um, and then the last is if you have an underlying uh, vitamin deficiency and you know, these sorts of things have been described ad nauseum like pellagra or scurvy or whatnot. And in those cases, you have to supplement with vitamins. But for the general population, having multivitamin probably doesn't matter. I know that some of the high endurance athletes who are burning and building sometimes will supplement with these sorts of things. The data is very sparse, and unless you're in these subcategories. So there you have it. Shaving hair causes it to grow back faster, darker, and coarser. This is an awesome one, and there's no evidence to suggest that. Some of it may be from observational evidence, because when you shave hair, the, the rounded tips, which are keratinous and, and small, look like your hair uh, is growing, and then what's left is the stubble. So it may look like it's growing back faster. But the truth is, there's no evidence to suggest that if you shave more often, that your hair will grow faster. And, and conversely, it's true too. That's dictated by your genes, by pattern baldness, by other factors, and also by your own makeup. In my case, it takes me months to grow a beard. And so it's a very arduous process. And I, I joke about it saying I'm gonna live longer because I'm in my boyish form for a longer period of time. But there's no evidence to suggest that shaving will cause you to grow a beard faster. Chemicals in deodorants and antiperspirants can cause breast cancer. So there's no evidence of that. And the idea that you can absorb uh, all kinds of um, absorbing materials which you put under your arms um, through your lymphatics and whatnot being deposited in your breasts um, has never been shown to be the truth. And, you know, everyone is now going back to natural products and, and um, organic and whatnot. I don't think there's any clear-cut evidence that this is a thing that one leads to the other causatively and with mechanistic details. So I wouldn't buy it. If your mucus is green, it's a sure sign of an infection. So this is an interesting one. We were always taught that if you have clear mucus uh, when you blow your nose and whatnot, that it's just either a cold or allergies or something like that, and that when it turned yellow or green, the likelihood was that you had a bacterial overgrowth. The issue is that when you have stagnant mucus, either in a sinus membrane or in your, in your nasal cavities or in your throat, there is bacteria naturally occurring there and it can infect that mucus. So the real question is, are you symptomatic from that? And ultimately you're treating the symptoms because you wouldn't treat a cold, which is a viral illness, with antibacterials. That's the key to this. Whereas you would treat a bacterial overgrowth with antibiotics. And so you have to understand what you're treating. And I would say it doesn't exist in a vacuum that just because you have colored mucus, you should go on to a course of antibiotics. I think a lot of people who've had colds and whatnot will say, you know, in the morning I have colored mucus and by the end of the day, it's all gone. Well, that makes sense, right? That mucus is just sitting there and it's stagnant and it's got bacteria there. And the bottom line is that you will infect it. By comparison, um, by the end of the day, it's free flowing and you've basically um, blown your nose a few times or coughed or done everything else because these are all protective uh, mechanisms. And so the answer is, will it have some bacteria and stuff? It may, but do you have a bacterial infection where you're having symptoms with it, that's not conclusive unless you have the symptoms and it continues throughout the day and you need to be treated with antibacterials. So the critical point is this, that not all colds should be treated with back, uh, antibacterials or antibiotics. Um, in doing that, we're gonna generate huge antimicrobial resistance and we will put ourselves at risk of not having the antibiotics we need um, to treat things because they get resistant to it. And finally, a toilet seat can make you sick. Wow, this was a good one. <laughs> and the answer is no amount of toilet seats can make you sick. And the interesting part is it's more 
for your own self that you don't want to sit in another, another person's uh, toilet seat after they've already been on it. Now, look, if th this is a tricky one because there's no evidence that the seat itself can make you ill. But the truth is, it's in a toilet. If things splash and they end up on the seat and it's not cleaned, and then you touch that and you don't wash adequately, you could contaminate any food you're prepping, or alternatively, if you touch your face or something like that, you could get an illness. Is that the toilet seat getting you sick? No, it's the fact that the toilet seat's dirty. And so you got to use some common sense with this, that a seat in itself won't do it. And if you go on any airline, you go on any public toilet, they always have these sheets that you pull out. I think they're more for convenience because no one can clean that toilet, right? And so it's not the toilet seat getting you sick, it's the fact that it's getting messy and that becomes the issue. But the common sense would dictate to make sure you wash your hands for 20 seconds when you go to any bathroom, even your ones at home, but in particular if you're on an airline or you're in an airport or you're somewhere else. Because in those cases, it's pretty doggone common sense that other people have used it. Uh, and that if it is contaminated uh, and you touch that and you don't wash adequately, then you could end up getting uh, gastroenteritis or some type of infection. But short of that, the seed itself is not the issue. It's what happens with the seed and where it's located. Thank you very much for joining us. Hit the like, subscribe and share if you like what we said so we can make more of these for you and leave comments below to tell me what other myths you want debunked. Uh, I've left a link to the NIH article and I also gave you a hint at how I look at data and it's important for you guys when you see this stuff because the infodemic is alive and well and I don't want you as part of this. I'm here for you. Talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us.